Um, by the way, once again, this camera is not supposed to be to get anybody here. Basically, it's just supposed to get that screen because Group A, y'all are going to be showing up Monday. Group B will show up Wednesday. Group A will show up again on Friday. But then next Monday, it's Group B. And then it's you guys on Wednesday. And them on Friday. But then you got Monday again. Anyway, silly listeners. Uh, but that's what we got to do to help reduce our chance of catching the crafty, crazy COVID. Uh, Alright? Okay. Uh, so, and like I said, I'll try to send the email. That email in the morning out to the class on Canvas saying, hey, it's an A day or hey, it's a B day. And if you're, because the class has to keep moving forward, uh, regardless of if you were. Um, if you're in class or not, uh, I'm going to be posting what we covered that day in class. I'll usually be posting it the day after because starting like about two weeks from now, I'm going to be getting really busy because I've got to be doing stuff with uh, the School of what Health and Science Academy at Plano East. I'm going to got three dual credit classes out there and be having fun with them. But I've already recorded, I already have all my uh, number one lectures. If your table's still a little dry, you might want to grab a paper towel and wipe it. I mean, wet. You might want to grab a paper. Because I did that for your safety. Okay, so basically, what are we going to try and cover in this class? Uh, it's going to be an examination of the political, societal, and economic uh, progress that Texas has made through a little bit of the Native, the Spanish, the Mexican periods, the Republic of Texas, uh, our statehood, our then ceding from the U.S., and then getting back into the U.S. and meeting up with industrialization, urbanization, uh, civil rights, and the complexities of modern Texas. What are goals and objectives? Well, basically, I want y'all to develop your positions on history. History is made of the same facts, but sometimes uh, either the introduction of a new fact or a different way to look at the old facts might make you change the way you think things went on. Okay? How are you going to be evaluated in this class? Because that's what you really care about. Uh, you're going to have a quiz after every lecture, at least the first 10 lectures. That's going to be 40 points. By the way, all of this is on your uh, course, concourse syllabus on our webpage. Uh, there's going to be something called thought questions that are going to be extracted from this reading, Texas Voices. You're going to have a midterm that's worth 20 points. And a final that's worth 20 points. If you add all that up together, how many points is that? 100. 100. So every point you are in this class, who gets their grade? I love it. This always happens. If you get an A, I got an A. If you get a B, I got a B. If you get a C, he gave me a C. If you get a D, he gave me it. No. Who's responsible for your grade? Who earns every single point through their blood, sweat, and tears? But I'm trying to help you out, guys. I will. Well, well, let's go into a little depth. Uh, the thought question deal, like I said, this is the first semester I've taught this up here. And the thought questions, I'm still working it out. What are the books you need? Well, your main textbook, and guys, I will try to get you on a reading list. Uh, so you can be better prepared for the classes, is uh, Beyond Myths and Legends, whoop, uh, Narrative History of Texas. If you want to know which edition you're supposed to get, because that'll help you with the uh, page numbers, it's the sixth ed edition. If you're trying to save money and you want to get a used copy, that's fine, but the page numbers aren't going to be exactly correct. Okay? And of course, it's available at your campus bookstore. And you know what's also cool is that uh, like about three of the authors on this are from uh, this college. So we're kind of helping out our own. 
And one of the guys on there, F. Todd Smith, the guy is an absolute genius when it comes to Native Americans. And I was actually his TA when I was uh, in the history school out at UNT. Real cool guy. <clears throat> the next book is uh, done by Dr. Keith Volanto, who some of y'all may have had for a prior history class. Uh, it's uh, Texas Voices, Documents, and uh, Biographical Sketches. Once again, this, you must excuse me for this is the fifth edition, even though you should have the sixth, and I'll see if I can get a six, so I can hopefully give y'all an accurate page number on where a certain reading is. And once again, this will be used for the thought questions. And once again, all this material is up uh, on the concourse syllabus. It's like one of the tabs at the very bottom of your uh, page. Thought questions, like I said, and so I know they got little questions at the end of every reading, and basically y'all will be answering those. Um, but I'm going to have to give some thought as to how I'm going to go about like doing a word count and stuff like that. But things I can tell you is that they're going to be typed I'm going to be double spaced, 12 point font. Uh, I haven't decided a word count yet. Um, and basically, the font style will be Times New Roman. <laughs> and grammar and spell check. And I'll probably allow you guys to submit that over. Um, I'll see what I can do to get it accessible in um, Canvas. Ready for the next one? Oh, the grading scale. Well, I know each one of these is going to be out of five points because you're going to have four of them. We could have two out of ten, but that would be too weird. Hmm. Uh, late papers, not accepted. We're in college now. And especially because it's electronic and you'll have from 11.59 a.m. to 11.59 p.m. Even if you wait to that day, which is probably the worst thing. You, guys, you know what to do when you're answering a, um, when you're writing a paper or doing an essay like that in college. What you should always do is three, Finish it three days before you have to turn it in. Then put it aside. Don't look about it. Don't think about it. Just ignore it for a day. Then go back after that day's rest. Because if you just immediately pick it back up, your brain is going to, and you read it aloud, first off, read it aloud. Don't just read it in your mind. Because if you just read it in your mind, your brain is automatically going to put words and phrases in that aren't actually on the page. Why? Because, guys, we think faster. Than, oh, we're, we're incredible, awesome computers and machines. But, guys, your brain thinks faster than you can actually go. Uh, so it'll make mistakes. So you leave it alone so your brain has time to reset itself and then come back and read it out loud. You can even read it out loud the morning the assignment is due. Because all you're going to be doing is changing it from a rough draft to a final cut, for lack of a better film terminology. Uh, read it out loud, because if you read it out loud, that will give you hints to what doesn't sound right. But by that time, most of the hard work is already done. Now see, that's what I say. Now what will most of you guys do? Hopefully, regretfully not, but most of you will probably write it on the day of. It's not smart. Try to avoid it if you can. But at least turn it in. Don't give yourself a zero on this by not turning it in. Yes, sir. How specific are you going to be on the word counts? Pretty specific. I mean, when you have people who, <laughs> because see, I used to have to say, like, well, make sure it's a three paragraph uh, essay. <laughs> how, how many sentences have to be in paragraph? Well, in reality, you can have a sentence that's one, I mean, a paragraph that's one sentence. If it's striking enough and bold enough, however, and you say every sentence, you have to have at least five sentences. <laughs> so word counts are better, because then it's just up, and you turn it in with it typed out on it. Um, 
and it's just easier for everyone. Because <laughs> if I say, do give me half a page, it'll do just a little less than half a page. Three quarters, just a little, a little more than half, a little more. So just to get it over that, that's not three quarters of a page. Yes, it is. Just to get over all that work down. Yeah. So you're using primarily as a minimum, or do you want a specific target? If we go over, it's also possible. You can go, no, I don't care if you go over. It just, you have to reach that. Kind of like in graduate school. In graduate school, I always hated that. Because you have the minimum words. And you probably will go over it, except they do kind of rake you over the coals if you go over All right, where is the meat and bones of your grade? It is in the quizzes. They will be online. The, you get four questions, multiple choice. You're going to have four minutes. To, you're going to have a four minute window from 11.59 in the a.m. to 11.59 in the p.m. to take this. Basically a minute question. I will tell you on Friday. Your quizzes are usually going to be on Monday. Except we got that weird MLK junior day that throws everything into a wackadoo. I'm not sure if I should do it because then I might get in trouble. You can't give students a sign. Anyway, um, basically a minute of question. I'm going to tell you the Friday before. Look, this is what you need to review. And guys, we also might have to have a little leftover slab of the lecture. If we have a leftover slab of the lecture, um, I'll also post that. You'll see there should be a link in, no, there's not one yet called video files. I don't know, a folder within your files on your uh, course page. If there is, I'll put it in there. And of course, uh, for Wednesday's class on Thursday, you're going to want to be looking at it to see what we went over on Wednesday. Okay? Uh, the total that you have in this is there's going to be after 10 quizzes. So, like I said about a quiz after every lecture, each lecture is about a week, you think, Oh, after the first 10 weeks, then um, that's all the quizzes we're going to have. Well, yeah, even though you're still going to have to know the material. And we might have a deal where, because of a break or something like that, we might not have a quiz over one lesson. But after we surpass 10 quizzes, I'm going to give you uh, at least two more. Uh, and that's nothing but free points I'm throwing at you. Because I know, guys, there's a whole thing going on out there. Out there, everywhere. It's called life. And that uh, will affect the way things happen in the classroom. And, like, you want to know what probably your worst grades in my class are going to be? The first time you have to turn in any new type of assignment. Because you don't know exactly, you don't know what kind of questions I ask. Even though I'll give you a review and say, hey, study over this. Um, the first assignment is always the most difficult. Um, after that, you should go over the hump. Uh, because we have this built-in system, it allows you, you know, the flexibility to, well, I got a two on that quiz. Well, I'll just pick myself up, because I can, because you got those three points. But if you see yourself getting a two, and another two, then a one, then a three, you know, that things have to be, uh, changes have to be made. Also, one of the things that I think is so good about this class is that we have the grade book. So at any time, you will know exactly what your grade is in my class. Okay? And like I said, I'll give you a, at least two quizzes. That's eight points. That's almost a full letter grade I'm giving you guys because oh, hopefully you'll do well in the uh, your exams. Your exams are also going to be online. Um, and uh, they will consist of about 20 multiple choice questions. Uh, there will be a folder in your um, Files deal on the course page that says uh, exam reviews. Usually I'll put them a week up before the actual examination. You're going to have 20 multiple choice questions. You're going to have 50 minutes to take it, which is more than two minutes a question. 
all right? And um, on this one section, makeups are permitted. Why is Professor Galloway such a uh, drop of sunshine? Well, because that's school policy. Uh, I mean, make up like, oh, I'm, I'm missing, I, I mean, I missed the final, I wasn't here. Yeah. Okay, you do get a chance to take it. Or, my, my grandma, it's always the grandma that died. It's never the grandfather. Or it's always something happened to the mom. Nothing ever happened. One time, something happened to her dad. And hopefully nothing will happen to any of you uh, that will make it so that it's not uh, possible for you to take it. However, because it is online, once again from 11.59 in the a.m., which is one minute before noon, to 11.59 in the p.m., you guys should. Unless some guys, life is made of, it happened. You know, like if you got into a car crash or if something incredibly horrific, we're not going to tempt the fates. We will, we will give them the justice of saying something can happen, but I hope it doesn't happen to any of you. All right? And the chances are that they won't. All right, any questions? Ready to start the magic journey? Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. When you post your the recording, are you going to have sound on it too? Am I what? Are you going to have sound on your recording when you post it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a camera that has a microphone on it. It's um, a Canon TR800, so. Yes. Is the sign up to you No. Your midterm will be up to the middle of the term, and your final will be, okay, this is all the rest of the stuff. And like I said, both of them, your final is your midterm part two. Midterm part two, the final. The Great American. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> 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 New World Encounters. Basically, this is a discovery in Native America. The role of history. Will you be putting the slides on Canvas as well? I will be put, I will try to put and hopefully get this to you guys, like I said before, uh, we go into that lecture, what I call Course Out Once, kind of like a Reader's Digest version of it, where you get three slides to a page with lines out to the side for you to take notes on, three lines. Um, even though I always have them up for my History 1301 and 1302, it's there as a tool. Most people don't print them off, which I think is foolish, because if you print them off, I will tell you that every student I've had that has printed them off has gotten an ARD. Just because it helps you so much when you take notes, expedite, quicken it up, rather than trying to write down every word. All right, now we've got to enter into a period known as prehistory. Now, what's prehistory? When does history begin? What? The beginning of written? Yeah. With, well, or some kind of record. Hopefully it's written. And hopefully that writing is decipherable. So then we can see. Now, even if it's like a cave painting, cave paintings are something written, giving us account of what was going on. If there's no writing or nothing like that, then all we can rely on are, are clues. They kind of give a hint 
as to the, what may have happened. Ready for the next one? Native origins. Now, how did the people get over here? Because, guys, everybody, even the Native Americans, and I'm 12.5% Cherokee. <laughs> but Cherokees aren't involved. Shut up. Everybody over here is an immigrant. Even the first persons. Now, one of the things that brought this up was at about 1926 near Folsom, New Mexico. Actually, it's a town that's even smaller than Folsom. But I put down Folsom uh, so that most of you guys would uh, be able to at least find that on a map. There was an African-American rancher by the name of George McDuncan. And basically, there had been a huge rain the day before. So he went out riding his fences, because basically, why do you ride your fences? To make sure it's not broken up. Yeah, to make sure they're still up. Because animals just like us, hey, I wonder what's over there. I'm going to go over there. That looks better. Anyway, he's going out riding his fences, and he sees there was this one area with a huge washout. But he finds in that area uh, ancient bones. And he finds, uh, um, you know, some of these bones. He takes them back to his house. And then you know what he does? Throws them in the sack. No, he goes back to work because that's what he has to do because, you know, can't make, got to make, gotta make a living. Well, of course, somebody, he talked to his neighbors. Somebody talked to the town newspaper. And they did a little article on it. And then it was shoved into a drawer. Well, this is why we thank God for graduate school, because a little bit later, a graduate student by the name of Jesse Figgins at the University of New Mexico, uh, he was looking for something he could write on and expand, uh, expand upon. And he's going through all the newspapers. He sees this account. Nobody's followed him up on it. He goes out to the guy, and he says, hey, can I have a look at that site where you found that? And um, George McDonald says, sure, go ahead, just don't bother the cows. He goes out there and he finds uh, bones with a, with a human fashion spear tip in the ribs of an animal. Now, what was the importance of that? The importance of that is that it said that people were in the area thousands of years before we thought they could be there, meaning they totally had to rewrite the books. Now in this new revision of history, how did they say that people got from the old world over here? Well, basically, uh, human movement has gone transpired through the environment change in human history. Okay? About um, 20,000 years ago, we were in an ice age. An ice age so severe that oceanically everywhere, waterfalls dropped by 300 feet. Why? Because all that was in ice. Everywhere across the world. Okay? And basically, this opened up a land bridge from Asia to the New World. And so uh, you had an ice, uh, the ice free uh, corridor opened up, and people started coming over in three different ways the Paleo Indians, the Nadene, and the Inuit, or the Eskimos. That's their modern day project. So they came, and why did they come? Why, why did they come over here, guys? They said, "Let's go exploring." Because it was there. Because they were following the who, the herd. They were following their food. Because guys, these are basically hunters or gatherers. I mean, that that woolly mammoth—that was your Walmart. That you needed that thing. 
Oh, and by the way, guys, you needed a whole group of people to take that thing down because you didn't have horses or anything like that. But you could get, you know, you could get your clothes, your house from its fur. You would even use like its bladder as a canteen. You'd use the tendons and sinews as, um, you know, things for your bow and arrow. Or to tie up things, because actually the bone arrow wouldn't develop until later. And so they're stuck in this little bitty place over here until about 15,000 years ago. It gets warm up enough that it actually opens up an ice-free corridor into North America. And they started coming down from there. So we have this whole theory of Asia, Alaska, America. Well, guys, did it work like that? Everybody got this slide? Well, let me tell you about a guy from Norway. Good old Thor. Here you go. Basically, this guy, and this guy was like, this guy must have like been an adrenaline junkie. Uh, I mean, he was a zoologist. His parents were scholars. He was a zoologist uh, and something else. And um, during World War II, uh, he fought in the resistance against the Nazis uh, in uh, Norway, having to basically run for his life and uh, live up in the cold north. Well, about 1947, he takes a look at some of the uh, archaeology stuff uh, from Polynesia, and he looks at some of the archaeology stuff from uh, South America, and he notices there's a lot of similarities here. You know, I bet... People didn't come down from Asia. Asia, I bet you they came from Polynesia and landed in South America and went up. Well, that's real fun if you just think that in your mind. Thor didn't keep it at that. He built the Kontiki, which would have been a vessel like they had back then, and he built it exactly like that. He had the same things they had to survive, meaning he didn't have canteens, he didn't have a radio, he had nothing. He, just had to use the stars for guidance. He had nothing that they did not have at the time. And actually he did in reverse. He sailed from Peru uh, to one of the Polynesian islands. But he made it. He showed it could be done. So did it go that way? Well then in the 19, in like 1936, somebody discovered some supposedly some art that looked like uh, Egyptian art, and maybe the Egyptians came over here. So you know what good old Thor did? He built the Ra. This isn't the Ra, this is the Ra too, which was an Egyptian boat. And he sailed it across the Mediterranean, no, he sailed it from Morocco uh, over here. And the Ra, it was doing great for a little while, and then it started falling apart. You know why? Because he didn't use the kind of ropes they would have used on their ship. Instead, he used more modern ropes. So he goes back, he realizes what an idiot he was, he builds the Ra 2, and he sails it over here, and it makes it, now that he's using the ancient ropes. Oh, and guys, the, uh, <coughs> the spear tip points that Native Americans over here had, they're called Clovis tip points, uh, they m resemble spear tips found in Spain more than any of the spear tips found in Asia. So is that right? Well guys, in legal courts, what never lies? It's made of three little letters for dinonucleic acid. Nobody knows the acronym for dynamic DNA. DNA. The DNA of Native Americans does resemblations more than anybody else. If you go down the matri, whatever it is. But these kind of things are always fun to think about. All right. Now the first period we're going to talk about is the Paleolithic era. This was like 13,000 to 8,000 uh, BC, or as historians are supposed to say, BCE, before the common era. 
but I'll just write BC. Save you a letter. Save you some ink. Basically, these were small nomadic bands of about 40 to 60 people in a group. They hunted the woolly mammoth. And guys, this is before they had spears or effective spears. The big mark for them was about 11 to 10,000 BCE or BC when they came up with the Clovis Point Spear. And there's a picture of that in your book. And they hunted woolly mammoths in Texas? Yes, they hunted woolly mammoths in Texas. Indeed, a few years ago, how many of y'all have been down to, how many of y'all been through Waco? On your way to San Antonio, Austin, stuff like that? Well, a few years ago, <clears throat> this is like the exit before you get off for the Texas Ranger Museum, which is the exit right before you have to go across the bridge, uh, across the uh, Brazos. But anyway, they found the biggest uh, find of woolly mammoth bones in North America, in Waco. They found about 20 woolly mammoths. And Baylor, of course, helping them out, uh, built up a huge uh, park out there called the Waco uh, Mammoth National Monument. And you can see, the, uh, you can go there, it's pretty cool. Uh, and it's in Texas. And it's, you know, it's a nice little drive if you're going all the way down to, uh, if you're going all the way down to San Antonio, you may as well get off there because you're going to be spending about an hour in traffic in Austin. You know what the sad thing is? You, how many of y'all can testify you're going to be spending about an hour in traffic trying to get about Austin, if not more? And so one time I was making a documentary on Gonzales, Texas, which was the birthplace of the Texas Revolution, and I had to get down to Gonzales. Well, I left here at about, I don't know, 1 o'clock in the morning, thinking, I'm going to make it through Austin, no problem. It was about an hour getting through Austin at about four, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And I was like, son of a gun. Well, then we entered into the archaic phase. At about 8,000 B.C. And during the archaic phase, people start living off of, well, what, what do you think one of the consequences of that warming trend was? Guys, why are we worried about global warming now? What is it doing to the animals? Changing the habitats? No, it's killing them. They're dying out. Polar bears. What's happening to their habitat? Even though the polar ice cap is actually getting bigger on the other side, and now NASA says that polar ice caps are growing. But we'll forget about that. The deal is, though, the woolly mammoths and stuff like that were dying out. Okay? And guys, you got a choice. Uh, either I can starve, or I can learn to eat something else. Well, they made the switch. Now they're living off vegetables, small game, and fish. Now, what are some of the consequences of this? They tied down to one place. Well, at least for a season, because they're still not totally sedentary. I mean, you know that, hey, if you go down to San Antonio during this time of year, there's going to be uh, pecans everywhere. And if you go over here during this time, well, that's when the fish are going to be going down the river and doing breeding. So basically, they would have, like, spring and summer quarters and fall and winter quarters. Uh, to make things easy. And now they're going to be in one place for a little bit longer. Well, what's going to happen to you if you stay in one place and have semi-permanent settlements? Once again, it's semi-permanent.
Oh, and just speaking about uh, foraging, uh, we have all foraged in our lives. And what is the best thing in Texas on a hot Texas summer's day that you find in the summer when you're a little kid? Usually from a wild bush that's grown by a, a steel fence. Huh? Honeysuckle. Honeysuckle's great, but have you ever had like the, the blackberries? The wild blackberries or raspberries? No, no. Oh, I guess they all die now. And now that you're living in one place, and also guys, uh, catching a perch is a lot less dangerous to your health than hunting a woolly mammoth. And now that you're staying in one place, you got something known as free time. What's free time? Time that you don't have to devote to making sure that your stuff is safe from an enemy. Uh, to make sure that you have food, enough food to survive the week. To make sure that um, you know, you're going to be prosperous. Free time is, we are so drunk with it now that we start to think of it as a right. And that professor told me to put my phone away. Man, it's such a jerk. Why can't I watch videos in class? <laughs> I, I was a TA, and so TAs get to sit at the back of the class and get to look and see. And sometimes it is disgusting what people will look at, usually men, uh, when they're watching. Don't do it. Anyway, but now, you have a population growth because you're in one place. Everything's kind of safe. You can be with your wife or be with your husband. And also because now we have free time, we can start asking the bigger things. Hey, why does it rain? Hey, where did we come from? You start seeing the development of culture, the religion. Not only that, but you have skill specialization during this time. Like finer stone tools are developed. Weapons like the Atalata, A-T-L, A-T-L, which basically is a stick that you'd slide a spear on and you threw that, the Atalata that had the spear in it that would provide more power, allowing the spear to travel further at a higher velocity. You also had the development of the bow and arrow. Women began to learn how to make ropes, sandals, and other goods out of the fibers of plants. <laughs> Dogs are domesticated. Now, what's so important about dogs being domesticated? Well, basically, dogs, remember, we didn't have horses over here. So dogs, you could tie like a tabioi, uh, which would be kind of a triangle, or an elongated triangle, with leather over part of it. And you could use the dog to help you transport uh, items from place A to place B when you were going to the next camp. Uh, why else do you think they had dogs? Why do we have dogs today? If you're a girl, why might it be a good idea for you to get a Rottweiler? Protection. Protection. What else? If you're a guy, why might it be a good idea for you to get a Rottweiler? This has to kind of do with protection. Security at home? Yeah, security. They can tell you, hey, something's going on, which my dogs do every time somebody knocks on the door. Hey, 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 hey! Why else? Why else should you, if you're a guy or a girl, why should you have a dog? Companionship. 
Yeah, they're companions. They're great friends. They're so cute, and they just dogs just love unabashedly. They just oh. And guys, also a big deal back then is you have dogs because in the summer, the you know food stores might be getting a little tight, so you eat them. And if you think, oh, Professor Galloway, that's so mean. People have pet pigs today, but guess what? We do with pigs. Them. Anybody here uh, was in a uh, four? What is it? Four F, four H. I'm thinking of my son. What's the agricultural group at high schools? Future Farmers of America. Yeah, the FFA. Um, I was thinking my, my my son's was the four H club, which helping hands with. Hey, so you got to help get him a scholarship in the UNC Chapel Hill. <clears throat> but if you ever do anything with the FFA. You've got a project that you've got all year long. You are working with that animal. You are taking care of that animal. And guys, you will get into, you know, kind of, oh, wow, well, you will have a special friendship with that animal. But at the end of the season, guess what you'll do? You'll sell it. Guys, they don't, they don't keep them because the new, next group coming up, they're going to have another project. So you sell it probably for slaughter. Oh, man. This is when you had the uh, Akpans, the Crankwas, and the Koei Tehans. The Akpas, basically, they were uh, four large groups living northern coastal Texas. Their name means eaters of men. But basically these guys were fishermen, hunters, gatherers. They never really went to agriculture. But they did fish. The Crankwest were five groups that lived uh, near the coast. In winter, they move uh, inland or out to Galveston Island during the spring and summer. Oh, and by the way, these guys were still around when Stephen F. Austin later would come here to try to settle Texas or to settle Texas because he did a good job compared to Green DeWitt. Meanwhile, the Koei Tejans, uh, they basically lived in the interior and a lot of South Texas. There were more than 600 different groups. <coughs> now guys, though, I want you to remember there is an incredible diversity among all these things. Like the Koei Tejans, okay, they're all a group. Kind of like us, we're all Americans, right? Right? So every American is the same, right? People from Maine are just the same as people from Texas, right? No, they might speak French up there. They might eat different food than we do. There's a lot more Spanish spoken here. We have celebrations, like especially down in San Antonio, Texas Independence Day, but also down in San Antonio. Got lots of celebrations that they don't have up there. But we're still Americans. Okay, okay, okay. So Texas, Texas, every Texan is the same, right? People from Plano are just the same as the people from... Salina. <laughs> have any of y'all been to Salina? Mm -hmm. Little, little... I, guys, I had to teach dual credit out there. It was just like going back to the 1950s in the classroom. All the, all the boys would answer the question on the girls to keep their hands down. It was very weird. Or, heck, we could say Plano and West Dallas. Are they the exact same? Um, we'll do Plano and San Antonio. Plano and San Antonio, are they the same? No, they're not. Different holidays, everything more uh, Hispanic spoken down there, Spanish. 
now higher Hispanic population, uh, different traditions, heck of a lot dif different history. Okay, okay, so then, all right, well, let's get back to Dallas. Everybody then in Dallas is just the exact same, right? No, north is totally different from south, which is totally different from east, which is totally different from west. And guys, if we want to get into it, if how many people here have been lucky enough to go to Europe? Europe's awesome. Europe's cool. And if you go to Europe or New York City, New York City is very European this way, and that you can have streets that are totally different from each other. Population-wise, who lives there? What their history is? But at the end of the day, they're all still Kovitekha, just like we are all Americans. Now, climate cultivation and the rise of new societies. All right, guys, I have both A and B on here because uh, we're in the census week. What I need you to do while I'll continue uh, going with the studies is just write an initial uh, over by your name to the side, like I would be ARG. Um, uh, DJA would be the first one. Uh, Musari MIA. Okay, just write your initials in that little square next to it, in that first column. Now, what causes this huge change? Well, guys, Native Americans love their television. Couldn't get enough of that CBS. Corn, beans, and squash. And chips. Corn, of course, was maize. It looks like it's about that time. According to my watch, that 